You were trained in acupuncture and oriental medicine at the Institute of Traditional Medicine in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the School of Traditional Medicine in New England and Boston. You served also on the Central Public Hospital of Pachutla in Mexico. What did you do there in the hospital? Well, actually, they, they brought me into the, I was working with the director of the hospital, and we'd see patients together, and then they just let me loose on the wards. And they had me working there just as a regular member of the staff. And I would see and diagnose and treat people, the, the hospital patients. And the, the director of the hospital was doing acupuncture, but in a very crude form. I mean, he'd make his own needles, and he wouldn't. People would just can't imagine what goes on when you leave the United States. But it was a very beautiful situation, and uh, I was actually. He found me. I was. Uh, this was about ten miles inland. I was actually working on the beach. I had taken over for the summer. There was a. Uh, they call it in uh, Mexico, uh, Spanish, cordendero. There was a, a healer who had this place overlooking the ocean. It was up on top of a hill, a little hut, a little with a roof and everything. And people used to come up there and get their treatments. And he needed to leave, go back to the states for a few months, and I took over for him. And I'd be sitting there on top of this military base and on top of the ocean and get, get sticky needles in people. And then I met the director of the hospital inland. He said, look, if you don't come here to work, I'm coming there. <laughs> wow. So, so I went to work at the hospital also. You actually see the restoration of the Hippocratic spirit in medicine as vital for the reintegration of how it originally started. And you say that without heart and without love medicine, that humanity can't be served with its desperate needs. When you were talking about how you prayed and you got goosebumps, don't you think the body is extremely intelligent? Like the body will tell you when you're talking about something or when you hear something, you get goosebumps. That's the truth instrument in the body, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you want to speak about that? I Actually, I just published an essay on intuition. I trained my intuition for like 20 years using pendulums. So it's like using pendulums like an amplification for that particular response. The body does have a response, like when people divine for water, and they, they're standing there with a divining rod. It's really, the, the divining rod is just amplifying the body's response, like the goosebumps. And the guy is going, is there water here? Yes or no? Water here, water here, water here. And when there's actually water, and there's a yes, you don't actually get goosebumps, but the body has this subconscious or unconscious neurological response. And the divining rods pick, or the pendulums pick up on that. So the answer is yes. Einstein defines intuition as a feeling, not as an emotion, as a feeling. And we do feel it in the body. Some people can feel it very strongly. And uh, using those as a, using intuition or using these signals as a navigation device as far as making decisions is very important. And getting back to what you were just talking about before, the Hippocratic Oath and, and love and medicine, this is a real, real critical point. I mean, the whole world is facing the consequence of having, of having not tuned into love. My mentor in life, Dr. Christopher Hills, who created the University of the Trees 30 years ago in California, he said to about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, love is not, is, is, is not an option anymore. The human race needs it to survive. And if we don't tune to it, we're not going to make it. See, I have chills as you're saying that. <laughs> Right now. 30 years later, and it's so obvious that the world has turned its back on love. I'm not talking about everybody, but in mass, and medicine is a great example of that. It's one of the nastiest places to be if you're not tuned to love because it turns to, to destruction and hurting people one way or another. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of my work right now, a lot of my writings, I'm just launching three new sites, one on uh, agriculture and natural news about the threat of you know, agri agricultural apocalypse, 
Are you talking well, about no. with the genetically modified seeds and stopping farmers oh. and the whole bit, right? Oh, yeah. it's, no, it's, it's, it's a night, another nightmare. Right. Uh, anyway, the whole world is coming into a crisis period, and, uh, you know, the elite of the world certainly are not tuned to love, the people who are trying to, to steer our planet and everybody on it, and uh, modern medicine and this whole health care reform, they're not reforming medicine. They're bringing an unloving, cruel type of medicine to more people, more millions of people more. Right now, if you have an emergency situation with your health, the first thing you think of is going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The hospital doesn't use a lot of the protocols that you've discussed and more that Correct. you've written about. So the allopathic, traditional, medical, pharmaceutical approach to healing and wellness in emergencies is very different. Short of having limbs crushed or the need for true emergency surgery where something has to be removed or you had a part of your body that's crushed or something has happened violently to your body, if you have another kind of emergency, it doesn't seem to me that the existing hospitals have the consciousness and the advanced paradigms, processes, and methodologies to treat people and save people quicker. So my question to you is... Do you see a day in our lifetime where we can have a parallel emergency clinic facility all over the world that is operating in this other paradigm that you're part of and I'm part of and others are part of? Well, it's a beautiful dream. I mean, it's, uh, you're, 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 you're out ahead of me even. My, I've been very happy to, to know that actually in a very few short years, these past uh, four or five years, and especially these last two, that have actually been able to affect the practice of medicine in the world. That there are people and clinics coming on all over the world who have read my work and are beginning to institute it in their practices. Um, and I'm talking principally about the use of these, all of these, uh, these three, my th three superheroes, magnesium chloride, iodine, and sodium bicarbonate, they're all emergency room medicines. They're only medicines when you inject it, even though they don't inject iodine unless they're doing some sort of test, and then they use a very toxic form. But these three are emergency room medicines, and that's why I call my work natural allopathic. They're emergency room medicines, but they're not pharmaceuticals. Got it. So, yes, in the ideal future, actually everybody would be using these things. They are using them anyway, but they don't use them correctly. They don't use them really in a way that people are even getting 20% of the benefit they could. And that is because emergency. why? Well, well, take magnesium chloride, which is a, <clears throat> a medicine they use for either heart attacks or strokes. If you, somebody's having a stroke and you inject it right away, the chances of you having complications and permanent damage decrease incredibly. And in fact, in Los Angeles, the, they're doing these tests where they uh, authorize the technicians and the ambulances when they get to a house and a person's having a stroke to inject the magnesium chloride right away. In a hospital, they normally use it for heart attacks, except it's like number five on their protocol. It's not the, the first four are ph pharmaceuticals. If they, one doesn't work, they go to the next, the next, the next. And then at the end, they use the magnesium chloride or magnesium sulfate, inject it, and it almost always works. But it's... Um, like sodium bicarbonate. They like to keep it as far away from the mainstream as possible because it's, there's no money to be made in it. So uh, sodium bicarbonate, injecting it is a very narrow use of sodium bicarbonate. If you use it, drink it, or nebulize it into lungs, or take, throw a pound or two or three into a bathtub, you're talking to a whole new level of access. I wish that Arm & Hammer made bigger boxes of baking soda. Well, they, they, make, they make pretty big boxes. They do? Yeah, I think a 10-pound box. Fabulous. What about for asthma? 
Is there something in this mix that would help asthma? Yeah, sure. 